Opera Night with Paul Harriet. And now we go to the stage of the National Opera House for Wexford Festival Opera Live, presented by Paul Harriet. Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Herriot. You're listening to Opera Night live here on RT Lyric FM and a very warm welcome to Wexford and to this, the opening night of Wexford Festival Opera 2024. Now celebrating its 73rd season and, as always, at this time of the year, you join us live from our magnificent National Opera House here in the town centre and where we welcome not only all our listeners on Lyric but through our association with the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union and as part of their premium opera series we are also delighted this evening to welcome listeners joining us, listening right now, in Latvia, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Croatia, Germany... Serbia, Switzerland, Spain and Portugal, as well as the many more of you who are joining us now on the video stream of RTE Culture. And believe it or not, in all, that is actually a reach of some 12 million listeners and uh, something I don't like to think of right now. But nevertheless, to each and every one of you, wherever you're listening, we would like to extend a very warm welcome to Wexford and to this year's event. Well, opening this year's season, we have what's been described as a quintessentially Italian opera, Pietro Mascagni's Le Mascare. This, we're told, is Mascagni's homage to Rossini and to the Italian opera buffa and commedia dell'arte traditions. Well, it was actually performed for the first time at the turn of the last century, and I mean the very turn, back in 1901, and believe it or not, simultaneously in six Italian opera houses. However, apart from Rome, the reception was apparently, well, somewhat lukewarm, and it does seem that Mascagni at this time wasn't quite able to repeat the success, the huge success, of Cavalleria Rusticana, arguably his best-known work, all of which could well be refuted within the context of Wexford, where four previous Mascagni productions most recently Yemo Ratcliffe back in 2015, which was, as I remember, actually recorded for a CD by Lyric, all have been enthusiastically received. Well, the title, Le Mascure, actually refers to the masks of that Commedia dell'arte tradition. And in the prologue, the players and their impresario present the characters that we are about to meet. Well, these characters are Brigella a travelling salesman, and a travelling salesman with a propensity to spike drinks. I really can't put any other put it any other way, because that is what happens. Then we have Dr Graziano, a man very much of the law, Columbina, his maidservant, in love with Brigella, and one of the best-known characters in the tradition, Pantalone, a wealthy resident, along with his daughter, Rosara, our young love interest, and she is in love with Florindo. We have a very stuttering Tartaglia and the Captain Spaventa, the frightful Captain Spaventa, and indeed that is actually how his name translates, along with his long-suffering manservant, Arlecchino. Well, the remaining three acts are the play itself, where after many misfortunes, Florindo and Rosara, aided by Colombina and Arlecchino, managed to prevent the marriage to the captain, which Rosara's father had planned for her. And instead, Pantalone actually agrees to the wedding of Rosara and Florindo, but on the one condition that in nine months' time, a beautiful Pantaloncino will be born while the opera itself ends with a joyful hymn, a praise to this tradition of the Italian mask. And that will be sung in chorus by everyone 
present. Well, it's time now to introduce our cast this evening. And in fact, doing the introductions himself in a spoken role this evening, Peter McCamley takes the role of Giocadio. He is a professor and an expert, and I say that quite advisedly because it is he who will actually well, do my job for me, which is just great because he'll introduce all the characters that we're going to meet in the play itself. Rosara is sung by Lavinia Bini. Arlecchino, the manservant by Benoit Joseph Meyer. Colombina, sung by Joanna Constantine Piplea. And Brigella, our salesman, sung by Gillen Mangia. The frightful Capitano Spaventa is performed by Matteo Mancini and Dottore Graziano Balanzone, our man of the law, by a great Wexford favourite, Rory Musgrave. Florindo is sung by Andrew Morstein. Tortalia, the poor stuttering Tortalia, by Giorgio Carduro. And Pantalone, the Bisognosi, Pantalone himself, by Mariano Orozco. Well, tonight's production is directed and designed by Stefano Ricci with choreography by Stilario Di Blasi and the chorus of Wexford Festival Opera, chorus master Andrew Sinnott and the orchestra of Wexford Festival Opera with concert master Fanula Hunt, conducted by well, principal conductor of Wexford Festival Opera, Francesco Cilufo, a face very familiar to Wexford audiences. And uh, as principal conductor, in fact, of uh, the opera here in Wexford, he was reminding me that he started, actually when I did, with Resurrezione back in 2015. Well, applause for Francesco as he takes his place at the podium. But before the curtain rises here at the National Opera House, and as is always the tradition at Wexford, the audience now stands for the National Anthem on the beat. Maestro, I really, Maestro, I really have to interrupt the rehearsal as I absolutely need to call the performers to stage to explain a few things to them. Rehearsal? What do you mean rehearsal? This is not a rehearsal. <laughs> this is a performance who just played the national anthem. Haven't you noticed? Look, who's behind me? <laughs> oh, well, nobody told me the audience was already in. Uh, probably better that way. Uh, this means that I can help the audience. Good evening, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to understand what these masks mean, and try to see past the comic characters they represent. Uh, and all this for the price of a ticket, which is not cheap. <laughs> Shall we enter now, please? So, as I'm sure you know, these masks used to represent the good and bad qualities, the, uh, the vices and virtues of people long ago. Every actor uh, would choose a mask to wear and go on and specialize in that role, spending their entire career performing it. A uh, lover, a wheeler dealer, someone mercenary, a grumbler. Each character would focus on one 
type of human being that you could recognize from the costume. But what do these masks mean nowadays? Now that they've become more sophisticated and not so obvious, uh, what sense would there be in putting on a commedia dell'arte without first explaining to the performers uh, what the subject is, who are the modern day characters they will have to perform, and where the action is set? Well, this evening, you, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, will have the good fortune of hearing just such an explanation and understanding the significance of staging an opera like Mascagni's Le Mascheré in our own time. The psychoanalyst, Jacques Lacan, has drawn attention to the fact that symptoms present themselves under a mask. Disguises that men and women constantly put on uh, correspond to what human beings show others of themselves in everyday life. So what is the function of these masks? A set of behaviors we continue to find, even if better camouflage today. Self-defense, definitely. Constructing a fictitious identity of oneself, concealing who we really are. That's what's wrong with our society. And what better place to throw off the masks we wear every day than a wellness center? <laughs> Where, by taking off the clothes that distinguish us, we can arrive at a deeper sense of ourselves. And yet, even at an exclusive five-star wellness center such as this one, we'll find it's one thing to take off your clothes and another to shake off the habit of behaving badly that goes back to the dawn of civilization. <laughs> the masked characters are the protagonists. Captain Spavento, the big man looking for acquisitions, an entrepreneur with the help of his trusty assistant, Arlecchino, a servant who is ever loyal, but only to himself. He helps Captain Spavento propose to the beautiful daughter of the doddering, grasping Pantalone, the manager and proprietor of this exclusive paradise, and to swindle him out of the dowry. Tartaglia, classic big mouth is a waiter at Pantalone's Wellness Center and speaks in a rather special way. Our Pantalone is delighted by the planned marriage and dazzled by the captain's conspicuous wealth. Aiding him in his scheme is Dr. Graziano Balanzoni, his right-hand man and VIP guest at the center. The two pining lovers, Rosara and Florindo, she, the CEO of the family business, he, its marketing manager, are secretly in love and desperate. But Brigella, company master, comes to their aid with the help of Colombina, Rosara's PA. The four of them seek a way of thwarting the dreaded marriage. Now, I won't go on to reveal any spoilers. Uh, maestro, if you'll accompany me back, I can help the performers get into character in this show where masks are stripped off to reveal other masks underneath. And I'll leave you, members of the audience, to discover that Pantalone, Brigella, Colombina, and all the others don't live just here on stage, but are sitting right beside you. At the end of the day, if we look closely, our lives are nothing more than a wonderful commedia dell'arte.
información. Llévete el algo verlo. Con público te salvo, sí, señores. Ho molti radi e punti di contatto, primo che come il mio vestito è fatto, io ho per tutte di tutti i colori, ma qualche falsia qui più mi avvicina, è il lapso original, la fischiatina. <ride> A 
a farsi una ghigna, a farsi un muso. Thank you, Maestro. Now let's get started. And always remember, among the dramas of life, the most pathetic, or also the most tragic, is the pretense that we are something we are not.
porta d'entrata Se arrivo col dolore Da posto dominata E se viene qui, usami di là Se viene là, usami di lì Ma non potrei così Ma non è di me fa Tu là, io qui
pochettin di foderà la testa, un pochettin di pendola non vende, ma con la scopa entriamo, la porta è questa. So the end of Act One of Pietro Mascagni's Ascare gives us a chance to reflect on everything that has transpired so far within this tale that simply basks in that true tradition of commedia dell'arte. 
the protagonist of the first scene, Brigaela, a rather dodgy kind of salesman, praises the therapeutic powers of his ointments, cabbages and creams to cure scabies. And Rosara reads a letter from her beloved Florindo. Colombino, who for her part would like to marry Brigaela, informs Rosara of the intentions of Pantalone, her father, who's promised her hand to another man, the frightful Captain Spavento. And that, needless to say, does not sit well with Rosara. In fact, she refers to him as a people killer. Rosara, Colombina, Florindo and Brigaela send Tartaglia to scout ahead. Well, a solemn and ironic march eventually introduces the awful Captain Spivento, who's actually decided to make matters worse by having the wedding contract between him and Rosara signed that very same evening. Well, after the expected reaction of indignation by Rosara, Colombina, Florindo and Brigela, the latter of the group, Brigela, true to form, decides to use his own powder to spike the drinks of all the people present at the time of the signing. Well, Pantalone complains that his daughter is not quite ready yet and orders Totalia, the least suitable man for the job because of his stammer, to entertain and divert the captain when he arrives by describing the town. Immediately after, Pantalone invites Captain Spavento to come to his house. They both somehow manage to ignore all the impending mockery. Well, all of this plays out upon a lush carpet of greenery and giant bamboo in this contemporary setting of a wellness centre, a spa really, uh, designed by director Stefano Ricci and surrounded by what almost seems to be a kind of jungle. Well, as Act Two begins, our gaze falls upon a luxurious recliner with a silver salver atop, and the curtain rises on two towel-clad gentlemen, flat out on treatment tables. Florindo and Rosara now decide to renew their promises of love, and after the two have separated, following Colombina's warning that she'd noticed the arrival of some other people, Arlecchino once again appears in the scene and offers Colombina two marriage proposals, one of which is intended for the woman who in her part will almost describe in a much more vivid term her ideal man. Well, Arlecchino believes that he's more than capable of reading his own portrait in the woman's words. Well, we now have a chance to ruminate once again on how all of that is likely to turn out as we await the arrival back on stage of musical director, principal conductor here at Wexford Festival Opera, Francesco Cilufo, who will return to the podium here in the pit of the National Opera House. As we continue now with Act Two of Mascagni's Le Mascare. Thank you. 
sesso solo. La piacente non è ta una ventura con modi coeletta. Cammino con i tuoi livrea, ma nobilore, oh cento miglia quarto, il mio naso è un ritaglio di sarco, e brilla l'occhio come un prisma di vetro, e ogni orba d'occhio e da pantina di dietro. Qui sono ambasciatore del capitano. Arias, lega il mezzano.
So in Act Two of Pietro Mascagni's Le Mascheré, Arlecchino, manservant, to the much maligned Captain Spavento, believes that he can read his portrait in the woman's words. But Brigella, a travelling salesman, interrupts him and after abusing him by kicking him once again, praises the qualities of his own magical powders. Well, immediately after this exchange, the deceptive powder is deployed and, true to form, used to spike everyone's drinks, which immediately takes effect, creating utter chaos that ruins all the marriage plans for the captain and, in the end, Arlecchino and the captain are left alone. That captain from whom Dr Graziano, our man of the law, had inadvertently stolen a suitcase. Isn't it uh, strange? 
how there's always a misappropriate suitcase available on an occasion such as this. Act two of Pietro Mascagni's Le Mascare, Mascagni's homage to Rossini and the true Italian opera buffa and commedia dell'arte traditions, performed for the first time back in 1901 and chosen as the opening production for this year's Wexford Festival Opera, now celebrating its 73rd season. Paul Harriet, with you here on RT Lyric FM for opening night coming to you live from the stage of the National Opera House here in the town centre. Well, earlier on this week during the dress rehearsals, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to talk to Wexford Festival Opera's principal conductor, Francesco Cilufo, of course, at the helm of the orchestra this evening, along with Italian soprano Lavinia Bini, who tonight sings the role of Rosara, and a great favourite here at Wexford, Irish baritone Rory Musgrave, who sings the role of the doctor Graziano Balanzone in tonight's production. <laughs> Opera Night with Paul Harriet. So I'm Francesco Cilufo, principal conductor here at the Wexford Festival, and I'm conducting this year the production of Mascagni's Le Maschere. Francesco, welcome back to uh, Lyric. Uh, Mascagni's Le Maschere um, is very often described as his homage to the traditions of Commedia dell'arte but uh, also to Rossini. Yes, I think um, people expect from a Mascagni opera something quite different that you get from the Mascara. You were absolutely right. Um, Mascagni decided, because he was nominated um, director of the Conservatoire in uh, Pesaro, so the hometown of Rossini, uh, decided that he wanted to pay homage to Rossini and to generate to Italian opera buffa, because he felt, you know, he himself being the, you know, the hot name of Verismo with Cavalleria Rusticana, he felt that, um, to quote him, uh, we forgot how to laugh on stage. There's far too much drama going on, but, you know, we should remember that a good part of our operatic history as Italians was opera buffa, was Rossini, and before that it was Cimarosa, Paisiello, the wonderful, you know, Napolitan comic opera school. Um, what he did, Mascagni, and that's, I think, what, one of the most amazing things about this opera is that it was written in 1901, so, and it was actually premiered two weeks before Verdi died, and I think it's not by chance that I, I mentioned Verdi, because it, it's in a way... Mascagni's version of Falstaff, in mm -hmm. a way. So how to do, which is, in a way, he did what Verdi did. He wanted to face and confront and measure himself with this amazing past of, of comic opera that was not there anymore. And there were uh, quite uniquely, I think, several opening productions, simultaneously, in fact. Yeah, I think that was the first and last time that ever <laughs> happened, and for a reason. I think, you know, we are used now to Taylor Swift and that kind of media handling of, yeah. of, of how things are done today, but, you know, you have to remember that in 1901... <laughs> Uh, you know, was ages before any concept of, you know, PR, PA, whatever happened. And mass centers. And mass centers. So in a way, what the, it was really brave, edging on, you know, hubris, I would say, that he decided to have an opening night simultaneously in seven theatres. Eventually it was only six because N Naples had a problem uh, with opening night because singers were sick. Because you have to imagine, seven premiere means that you have to have seven brand new casts and production and conductor. It's bizarre nearly it's, for the time. It's, it's, <laughs> I think it, it, wants to be, it wants to be a statement. They really want to force back into the stage comic opera, Italian comic opera. And in a way, we have to give Mascagni the fact that, you know, you may like or not what 
mm, came out with Le Maschere, but he was the very first one to do something that became very popular in music, and not only in music, only 20 years later, which is neoclassicism, mm -hmm. you know? He mm -hmm. was the first one, you know, decades before Strauss, before Busoni, to think that um, it was about time to revisit the past through the modern eyes and use some forms of the ancient kind of Commedia dell'arte or comic opera. There are 15 operas, I think, aren't there? Some 15 operas there, thereabouts, but... Uh, at this stage, as I understand it, after the huge success of Cavaliere Rusticani, he was looking for another success, and that didn't come easily. No. Well, I have to say, first of all, I think clearly Mascagni uh, was a bit, like, in a way, like Puccini. Uh, he, he, he was not really like a comic opera composer. So, you know, Puccini has definitely scored higher with his Gianni Schicchi, his only real comic opera, uh, but he wasn't exactly his forte. I think generally what made Mascagni never really reply the success of uh, Cavalleria Rusticana was that he always tried something new. Like he would, he, he would never write the next opera in the same kind of genre or, you know, style or expressive word of the previous one. And I think that was the problem. In a way, if you think... But very creative and very brave. Very brave and really, really in, in tune also, sometimes even like with Le Mascare, well ahead of his time. I think uh, the problem is that uh, even then the market uh, loved to have labels. And in a way, what Puccini really understood was that if he was going to write the same kind of opera, although with different music of course you know he, he would have you know he, he was going to be the real very successor and it's interesting because um, I keep reminding when, when I work on a Mascagni opera that actually when Verdi was alive Verdi thought that Mascagni was going to be his heir you know his successor mm -hmm. uh, because in Cavalleria Rusticana Verdi saw something very modern but still linked to do, to what he thought was the Italian tradition, you know. And he thought that Puccini was a bit too much into the German and French music world. Um, so he thought that Mascagni was the next one. Uh, and in a way, um, while Puccini is, is, is doubtless, uh, you know, a genius, uh, in a way, he was never quite as daring as Mascagni. And I think Mascagni paid, I think, a bit for being so daring, you know, and, and a totally different composer. And I think that's also what you see in Le Masker. There's so much going on musically that you almost sometimes want to narrow a bit the, your view to understand what's going on, where Puccini had just the, the most amazing skill to write just enough to entertain without, you know, doing too much. There's also, in this particular production, also a lot going on in terms of the overall subject of the festival, which is theatre within theatre. And so there's an unorthodox, but I thought very effective, opening to this piece in which you're involved, <laughs> where we have our actor who explains to us as the professor who all these characters actually are before we even set off on the journey. Yeah, it's interesting that, and you're involved. I am involved, <laughs> yes. I have to say, I, I, this counts as my, as my acting debut in English. Yes, yeah, so say. you're going to be uh, continuing in that vein. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I think, as, as I would say in America, I, I would rather stick to my day job, I think. You know? <laughs> uh, um, yes, but actually, that's not, uh, that's, that, that spoken beginning, you know, in which basically, I mean, I, I'm sure I can give this away, Basically, I start the overture, and, uh, and the public thinks, well, you know, here's the overture to the opera. And we are interrupted after a few moments by the so-called kind of capo comico, it's called Joe Cadillo, who is basically the stage director, who thinks that this is just a rehearsal, so he wants to bring the character in to present the character, to talk about the character. So, but, and so there's actually a, a bit of a spoken moment before the opera starts. But this is actually really, that's what Mascagni thought. And that's, again, something completely revolutionary, which actually is also explains why it wasn't that successful. Because people, especially in Italy at that time, you know, they were either going to see a play or an opera. They hated for the two things to be mixed up together. 
um, they, in fact, they really hated when on stage you had a mixture of things. You know, famously, when Othello, Othello by Shakespeare was translated into Italian and given as a play in Italian, they had to cut out from the play all the kind of, you know, mixed uh, comedy-like lines because the people would, you know, would not want to see a tragedy with a different language other than a very high, you know, aristocratic, elegant language. So Mascagni, to bring something so real, so incredibly modern, like, you know, the orchestra being interrupted, spoken text, and then the opera. I mean, that was really daring. This is all part of the alchemy of this as well, that you have Mascagni dealing with the Commedia dell'arte, which is uh, a much older convention, of course, yeah. but very fundamental to um, Italian theatre and performance. Yeah, I think because in a way, I mean, Commedia dell'arte is very Italian, but I think each country, um, every country, uh, theatrical tradition as some kind of Commedia dell'arte. That's but, so yeah. true. It might be pantomime, for yeah. example, yeah. in uh, Northern Europe. Yeah. So in a way, y- you have the usual kind of situation and characters that are almost like stereotypical. So you have the young, the two young lovers, the old father who doesn't want the, the daughter to marry the you know someone who wants the daughter to marry the rich and older man and then you have the rich and older man who make you know makes a spectacle of himself uh and then there's always the like the cunning servant you know it's it, those are recurrent types or stereotypes mm-hmm. through most theaters and i think what was interesting for mascagni and eventually became really really interesting for strauss or other italian composer like vol ferrari was to think that because of the mask, because of because of this not being a realistic character, then in a way some aspect of that could speak very much to the 20th century audience. So because the 20th century audience, I mean, if we think of all the theater, then, you know, Brecht and all that, is very open to the idea that, okay, I'm seeing a situation there, but what is really interesting is how is how the situation is presented and what's beneath, you know, behind that beyond that and I think that's when music comes really handy you know because if you think about uh, one of the most wonderful Richard Strauss opera Ariadne of Naxos mm-hmm. you have actually the mask of Commedia dell'arte there you have Brighella you have Arlecchino um, and the way they interact with the play within the play also in that opera uh, it's really telling but you know that was a good 10 years after Mascagni or the Mascara. Watching the rehearsals um one of the highlights, musically, for me at any rate, that, that, that came across, it's actually the writing in this particular opera for the chorus. Yeah. They're lovely moments. They're lovely moments uh, because the chorus is not uh, as much as a character as sometimes it is in other operas. If we think of Arriga Rusticana, the chorus is the rural community, the religious community, you know, the Easter hymn and all that. In this case, the chorus has... A, a very important function, which is again something kind of in between theater and 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 concert, you would say like um, they actually present the manifesto of the opera. You know, the manifesto says, you know, it's almost like uh, when I was rehearsing the opera, I would say to the chorus, you know, this is like a declaration of intent. That there's a kind of an anthem quality to it, and I think the closest thing you get to this is the end of the Meister Singer from uh, Wagner. You know, when because the the manifesto which the chorus sings in the occasion of of this you know party uh, is is an ode to the Italian mask, to the Italian art of comedy of the past, and saying that it's about time that this art is back, that is popular again. You know. Um, and so the, the color writing is really amazing because it's a mixture on one side of this very kind of almost liturgical, almost really uh, official big color writing. Um, and then at the same time, you have uh, things that are much lighter, like, you know, the, there's almost like a tarantella writing in at one point. There's a dance going on. Uh, and again, the, you know, going back to the dance of, you know, like uh, Pavana and all that. So dances from the 18th and 19th century. It's, 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 a, it's a fascinating mixture of things. And I do believe that nowadays the public is much more ready to engage with this because we know, in a way, 
way, Mascagni was really, really ahead of his time, but now we are here, you know, a good hundred years and more after that. And I think we, we can actually pick and choose and realize that, you know, it makes much more sense, I think. What are your own favorite moments in it? Um, what should we look out for, do you think? Well, I've, that's a difficult question to ask them. What should we yeah, look out for? Well, own, you know. <laughs> well, you know, as always, I always say that in Wexford, in a way, we, we all do a big act of love because we bring back this... You well, know, you're uncovering and yeah. revealing things, ostensibly for the first time. So you wouldn't ask, you know, a, a father wh- wh- who's, you know, who's the favourite <laughs> child, <laughs> although we know that sometimes yeah. there is a favourite child. So I think what I, I generally think, and this is, a, is also a, a choice that I make, made as a conductor um, I think w- rather they're underlining the most obvious kind of fast music passages like that sounds very much like Rossini and all that which are very helpful in the, in the, in the plot but they're not particularly idiomatic or personal to Mascani writing we tend to enjoy and emphasize the beautiful lyrical writing of some scenes. You know, there's a couple, especially there's a quartet toward the end, um, which on paper is just a quartet in which each person, each character is trying to decide a a method, like, you know, what to do next in order to get what he or she wants. So it's a very kind of calculated moment, nothing lyrical about that. But Mascagni makes it in this incredible concertante piece for four voices that brings on this genuine and really lyric and nostalgic melody. Because I think that's one of the uh, things that Mascagni learned and realized much before Strauss or Buzon or other people after him is that by bringing the music of what we perceive as being a gold past, a past in which everything was kind of light and funny like in the Commedia, we actually are confronted with how little of that is in today's world. And therefore, here comes the, no, you know, the nostalgia, the, the melancholy. This is something that, of course, Richard Strauss understood very well if we think about an opera like you know, Rosenkavalier or that. When you bring back the music and the, and the feel of this 18th century kind of golden war, but you make it relevant to today by realizing how different the world of today is. And so by putting these two things together, what, you, what, what is left on one side is, you know, entertainment for sure, because it's a funny night at the opera. But at the same time, there's quite something slightly more sad, something more melancholic about, which means that, you know, brings you to, to reflect about time passing and uh, season passing and, and ages passing and also what's relevant to certain past and what is relevant today. So it's actually, you know, as always with opera, I like to say, there's so much more going on than what you just see on stage. Well, Francesco will know what to be listening out for as we anticipate now the second half of this opera tonight. You're talking about time passing. Um, Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. Uh, today because it's a very busy time at the beginning of the festival and um, we look forward to celebrating well hopefully all being well your 10th anniversary (laughs) (laughs) this time next year this time next year at this very table yes okay (laughs) well thank you Francesco thank you so much as always thank you Good evening, I'm Lavinia Bini and uh, I'm doing the role of Rosaura in the opera Le Maschere of Mascagni. Lavinia, welcome to Lyric. Thank you very much for taking time to talk to us about this um, lovely, lovely piece and uh, your character in it of Rosara finds herself right in the middle of everything. She's the daughter of Pantalone, in love with Florindo but her father has other ideas and they're not good. Tell us about that. <laughs> My father wants uh, another um, husband for me, uh, that is uh, Capitan Spavento, and uh, he is a very rude uh, boy. I don't like him. And he's older. Too. Yeah, he's older too, but uh, it seems that uh, he has a good position, he, that uh, he has money, that uh, he came from uh, an important family, so this is the reason why my father wants uh, this. So she is really strong and uh, she has very, very clear idea about uh, what she wants 
Uh, but at the same time, she's fragile. She's a young girl. She's in love. So uh, she has all the, um, the thing that uh, the young girls have. But at the same time, she has the responsibility of uh, uh, this, the, the, the place where the opera is going on. Oh. Mascagni himself, a very um, well-known composer, this opera not so well-known. Have you sung a lot of Mascagni in your career? No, this is my first Mascagni. Really? Yes, yes. This is my first approach um, with him. And uh, I, he's Tuscany. He's from Tuscany, like me. Huh? So I have a very good feelings with uh, his music. I feel really comfortable with him. Lavinia, obviously, like most singers, you're no stranger to um, festivals and to the difference of festivals and so on. Yes, I I did uh, the Trittico of Puccini, uh, and this is the same production that we will do next year in Opera Bastille. And um, I I think that uh, about the question that you told me uh, about the energy of this festival. I think that uh, you can find uh, uh, the, the, the same atmosphere in the beautiful festival of Salzburg. Uh, and uh, uh, the, you, you, you can have uh, like the, 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 the feelings that you are in a uh, amazing place they like here they do four six uh, performance every day in different places of the town not only in the theaters because they have three big theaters Haus für Mozart, Felserei Schule, Grosses Feste Spielhaus but they do also other performance during the day in the church in the Mozarteum in the different places so it's full of music full of people that love music at not only opera because of course, there are a lot of concerts, a lot of uh, recitals, also um, instruments, a recital, and 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 you feel this energy and make music there. Like here, it's different. It's really different. Lavinia Bini, thank you so much for taking time and all best wishes, of course, for the thank opening you. night. I'm very very excited. My name is Rory Musgrave, I'm a baritone from Connemara and I am singing Dottore Graziano Balanzano from Le Maschere by Mascagni. The opera is uh, a commedia dell'arte homage by Mascagni. Basically, he fell in love with the commedia dell'arte format and he wanted to write a love letter to the comedies of Rossini and Donizetti and to the comedic heritage of Italian comedy and theatre. And so he wrote this piece really as a giant love letter and also as a way of experimenting with a new style, a new sound. So it's Mascagni in his proto-form, in a way, before he graduates to what we know later, at that lush verismo sound that we hear hints of here and there, but he's still experimenting. But he lands the comedy fantastically well. He takes these sketched archetypal characters and he gives them life and color, and they interact like wonderful chemistry. Uh, It's all these chemicals and ingredients that just suddenly spark off each other and creates a beautiful comic farce, basically. It's a comedy of errors where, of course, the wrong people are intending to get married and so on and so forth, and we won't give away the ending, but it's a beautiful, beautiful pastiche and to the comedy of old. Um, and it, it, it's an alchemy in every sense of the term. Absolutely. absolutely. Both in terms of the plot and the artistic sort of input. Uh, in completely. Theory. I completely agree. It has this transformative quality. And the nice thing with the uh, archetypal characters, these Commedia dell'arte characters, is that they are broadly sketched so the people automatically would recognize the the people that they're symbolizing uh, within society. But then within that, you get to invest and create and reveal through the use of masks and costume. You get to reveal 
what real humanity is actually like, how human beings really interact, uh, rather than getting bogged down in individual personality, you're actually looking at an exploration of society as a whole, and you're holding up a comic mirror to society. It was always an opportunity for people to not only laugh at what was happening on stage, but also gently to laugh at themselves. And that is where the real alchemy and the magic comes in, because what we do is we literally strip off the masks very deliberately, but even though the masks are physically removed, they're still there. And what we're trying to reveal is that actually all the masks that we wear in everyday life are invisible most of the time. And through this process of literally and figuratively stripping down uh, to bare bones and adopting more modernized um, vestiges, costumes, uh, settings, surroundings, uh, what we do is we're actually saying that nothing has changed. Humanity at its core is still as mad and as complex and as funny and as tragic as it has ever been. And that is why this is an art form is still so powerful and so relevant. And opera has, since it was really crystallized 400 years ago into its first, what we would recognize as opera, has stayed relevant. We're warned of this almost from the prologue, actually. I think we're told that, um, you know, if our attention drifts from the stage at all, we're likely to find the same characters on the left and right, <laughs> right-hand side of us. So clearly nothing has changed in the space of, of hundreds of years. What's interesting about this, actually, is that in terms of the design, which is marvellous, we actually begin with the traditional comedial art image, and suddenly everybody abandons that. Yes. And adopts it at the end. Yes. So it's all a bit in reverse. Absolutely. And I think that uh, the director and his team have done a marvellous job in um, understanding what the power of these characters, these archetypal Commedia dell'arte characters had and still have. But you're always faced with the question of how do you apply it to today? You could have made as... Uh, you could have made a completely valid choice in saying we are just going to do a traditional Comedia dell'arte farce in traditional costume from start to finish. And that would have been a wonderful and entertaining evening and people would have come away with something from it. Of course they would have. However, they've deliberately chosen to strip away those outer layers and to put us in a very modern context which is all about stripping back, about exposing one's true self and about letting go of masks, even if it's only temporary. And that is where the, the frisson of a more modern approach to this material really, really comes into play. And I think they've done a marvellous job in, uh, in doing that. And... And in a way, the thing that I love most about it is we're not hiding that transformation. We openly are there in these beautiful Venetian costumes with the masks and so on and so forth. And by literally stripping them off, um, we are symbolically and realistically showing the audience that what they're about to see is something bare, even though it is funny and it does still fall within the dramatic structure of the opera, we are still trying to reveal something. And I think it works really, really well. And, uh, and the comedy just still shines forth. And we have a romp of a time doing it. I'm not going to lie. Rory, the time has flown here. Rory Musgrave, now that we've spoken to you, we really feel we're back. <laughs> well, it was my pleasure. Really an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys the festival this year. Thank you very much. You're listening to Opera Night on RTE Lyric FM. Uh, 
And our huge thanks there to uh, the familiar presence here at Wexford of much loved baritone Rory Musgrave, as well as, of course, chief conductor of Wexford Festival Opera Orchestra, Francesco Cirufo, and Lavinia Bini tonight singing the role of Rosara. And you can listen back again to that interview if you missed the beginning or you want to hear it again by visiting the RTE Lyric Live webpage. Well, welcome back to the third and final act of Pietro Mascagni's La Mascare, Mascagni's homage to Rossini and that true Italian opera buffa and commedia dell'arte tradition, performed for the first time back in 1901 and opening this year's Wexford Festival Opera, now embarking on its 73rd season. And Paul Harriet with you here on RT Lyric FM for the opening night coming to you live from the stage of the National Opera House here in the town centre. Well, our production this evening is directed and designed by Stefano Ricci, with Francesco Cilufo, of course, directing the Wexford Festival Opera Orchestra, concertmaster Fanula Hunt, and, of course, chorus with chorus master Andrew Sinnott. As Act Three begins, Pantaloni, Bregela and Florindo still appear somewhat dazed by the chaos that had occurred with all that spiking of the drinks that happened earlier on. Rosara, asleep, is awakened to discover the presence of a strange man in her room, and Florindo now decides to challenge the captain, the much maligned Captain Spamento, to a duel. Colombina, pretending to reciprocate the attentions of Arlecchino, the captain's servant, gets him to promise that he'll persuade the captain to finally desist from his intended marriage plans. Meanwhile, the captain doesn't want to cancel his plan to marry Rosara, but is nevertheless now very intimidated by Florindo, who declares his willingness to challenge the captain to a duel. And I do hope wherever you're listening tonight, you're managing to keep up as we now prepare to welcome back to the podium Francesco Cilufo, who returns to the pit here of the National Opera House in Wexford for the third and final act of Pietro Mascagni's Le Masca. Thank you. 
occhi dunque a me a lui contratto fra nove mesi un bel pantaloncino So is the third and final act of Pietro Mascagni's Le Masquerade. Draws to its conclusion, Pantaloni decides finally to agree to the wedding of Rosara and Florindo, but on the one condition only that in nine months' time a beautiful Pantaloncino will be born. Mascagni's personal homage to Rossini and the true opera buffa and commedia dell'arte traditions of his native Italy. Performed for the first time back in 1901 and this evening in this performance coming to you live from the stage of the National Opera House here in Wexford, it opens the 73rd season of Wexford Festival Opera, where our chorus with chorus master Andrew Sinnott and our dancers uh, Andrea Drea Grossi, uh, Carlotta Pagliaia, Charles Ridiford and Miriam Tomei take their bows as Giocadio, Peter McCamley, enters to take his bow. Of course, he introduced us to all the characters right at the beginning. Rory Musgrave in the role of Dr. Grazio Balanzone and Marco 
Orusco, Mariano Orusco, I beg your pardon, in the role of Pantalone. The Capitano Svaveta, the much maligned captain, was sung by Matteo Mancini. Italia by Giorgio Caduro. And Arlecchino, the captain's servant, was sung by Benoit Yosef Meyer. Brigella, with all his magic powders, sung by Guillen Manguilla. And Florindo, our young romantic lead, sung by Andrew Morstein, with Joanna Pipelea singing the role of the kind Columbina. And finally, it is Lavinia Bini in the role of Rosara, who takes her bar as all of our principals now line up. And it's a rapturous reception from a full house here at Wexford. Always a very special feeling abroad, I think, on the first night of this particular festival. And I think that this opera, continuing that great uh, tradition of Mascagni here at Wexford, has gone down a treat. Francesco Cilufo, principal conductor of the Wexford Festival Opera Orchestra, the concertmaster for Nula Hunt, Francesco Cilufo, joining the orchestra now to take his own bars. And director Stefano Ricci, director, also designer of tonight's production. Joined now by the rest of the production team, choreographer Stellario de Blasi, lighting designer Daniel Naldi, and assistants Paolo Bonapace and Gianluca Zibuca. And now the full production team, the principals, the dancers, and chorus, all taking their place uh, to enjoy the applause. And that seems likely to continue for some time, being, of course, the first night of this year's festival. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow night, 7.30, and starting at 7, for a production of Stanford's The Critic, of course, based on the famous restoration play by Richard Brinsley Sheridan, a spectacular production that brings all the fun and the satire of theatre within theatre, this year's theme at Wexford Festival Opera, to life. That's tomorrow evening here on Opera Night Live. We'll be back with you then. Sound supervision provided by... Duffy and Davian, Damian Gavigan. Our technical backup provided by Owen O'Dwyer with production coordinator Peter Curtin and producer Gail Henry. I'm Paul Herriot. On behalf of all of us here at the National Opera House in Wexford, can I wish you a very good evening and thanks so much for joining us. So much more to look forward to in this year's festival and we'll be here to bring all of it to you. But in the meantime, I'm Paul Herriot. As I say, on behalf of all of us here at Wexford, a very good evening and time to hand back to our own Vlad Smishkevich back in the Lyric Studios. Mm -hmm.